Hello again and welcome along to The Good, The Scars and the Rugby in partnership with our friends at Allianz. It's been a big year and a big six nations and it's only April. We're into the break week, uh, so we're just going to take a moment to breathe. And speaking of breathing, we have Mike Dindal in Hello. the house. Hello, how are we? <laughs> it's good to see you. He's it's in studio with me. And uh, we are crossing live to the lounge of one Emily Scarrett. You're, on the, you're not on the farm, you're on, at, at your place, right? In my place in Leicester, yeah. Is it nice being able to do your own laundry and not having to go rescue your sports bras from colleagues? It's so nice. Do you know what? Irrelevant of whether actually your washing comes back or not, it's just nice to know that it's been washed properly because sometimes it comes back and it still smells a bit questionable and you just wonder whether actually some of it's gone through or you end up with somebody else's training jersey, which is just not what you want. You, I'm a bit, I like to know that things are clean and hygienic. So yeah, the radiators are full, the house smells great, but I've got to get it all back into a bag in about half an hour's time. With it, what is it <clears throat> if you go on on road for uh, sort of two weeks or whatever? What have you got a creature comfort routine you get back into? It's the first thing you like to do when you get back at home. Is it just ch- if you got that one couch that you just like to go veg on for a little bit? Is there something that you always <laughs> snack on at home that you maybe not don't get on get on the road that you've then got to go and you've got to go and chow down on or what 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 is it? There's always a creature comfort. Don't, please. Uh, if it was Elmer, I would imagine a cat would be involved or some, yes. some little animal. Um, <laughs> maybe a cow, your favourite cow. Just pop round to the to to, <laughs> to the uh, to the farm to give uh, old Betty a, a little pat. But no, uh, what, no what favorite, is it? No favourite cows. Um, the corner seat of the sofa always is nice to get back to. But do you know what the thing that I miss most is a well cooked poached egg? Because obviously you have breakfast in on mass and everything's cooked. You know big style family style and they're left in those hot containers and stuff and the poached eggs are either rock hard or still really snotty you know what I mean and a bad poached egg is really bad so I I had a couple of poached eggs earlier actually and just just being able to have them cooked how you want them is such a luxury it's the little things isn't so it? Is, is that is that just uh just as you prick them with the fork it they use a little bit, but they're cooked around or are you just really, really softly boiled in the middle? You don't want it gooey, you want it just soft. Oh, no, like hit them with the fork and they it runs out, but not so that the white, I want the white bit cooked. Can't handle a snotty poached egg. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the white needs to be stable yeah. and everything else <laughs> It's a good be word running. for it, stable. Yeah. Yes, it needs to have definitely solidified just <laughs> enough. Um, so what is a week off uh, during the Six Nations? How much of it is actually off? I mean, I had fantasies of you kind of baking up a storm and sleeping in and watching Bridgerton, but I'm guessing that's not <laughs> happening. Not quite, no. Um, no, so we're back into camp tomorrow. Um, so we had... The rest of the day off yesterday and today. Um, so just been trying to get the washing back round, just chilling out a bit, catching up on some kind of life mad admin and stuff that you let go slightly astray while you're in camp. Um, but then, yeah, back on the road tomorrow, back at Bisham until Thursday. And then we actually get like a long Easter weekend off. So that would be nice. So we get, uh, what's that, three days off over the weekend to eat some Easter eggs. And then test, and test week meets back in Monday or do you go down Sunday? Yeah, Monday or Tuesday we're back in. And then, so we go back to Bisham. And then if you're selected, a coach will takes us, brings us back up to Leicester. Um, and then obviously if you stay selected for the France game, you go then go back down and travel to France. So that, once you're back in, if you're selected for everything and involved in everything, then you'll be away for another couple of weeks. So yeah, but business end, isn't it? So it's exciting. He's used, a, <coughs> he's actually used a fair few players, hasn't he, so far through this tournament. How many players has he yet actually used? Do you keep count? Because there's been quite a bit of chop and change, isn't there? And it's hard now to figure out exactly what the strongest 15 would be. Like, I thought that it would be crystallised a bit more now, but I feel like somehow it might be even harder. Yeah, it's really hard. I think that's obviously a, a, a good place for us to be in as a squad. I wouldn't be able to quote the number, Tins, to be honest with you, but it has been quite a few. And he, he did say for everybody that, you know, put their hand up and trained well, then then you'd get an opportunity, certainly in the first few games, to to kind of show what you're about. And then obviously it would start to become more streamlined as you, you head towards the end of the competition. But yeah, there's, 
I mean, I, I wouldn't want to select the team right now. It would be, it's a really, really tough job. Some positions are absolutely loaded. Um, everyone's going really well. Um, and yeah, and I suppose to a point as well, you've got to select the team that you think is is capable of beating the team that you're playing against. And sometimes that means, you know, very good players perhaps aren't selected for that game. Um, let's go with the, the biggest, well, I think the biggest thing, obviously playing at the greatest stadium ever, uh, King's Ooh. Home on the weekend. Ooh. Um how was it? Fourteen thousand six hundred and eighty-nine people. How was that? It looked rammed. It was so good. Like obviously, all in the week we'd heard of the numbers and potential record-breaking crowd for like a standalone game and whatnot in in England. Um, but I don't think until you actually get there and you see it and you hear it for yourself, you you kind of believe it. But it's just so nice. Like when you come out to warm up, if you whoever you get close to start cheering you start start shouting start clapping whatever and then the bit that I was really looking forward to and and definitely dis- didn't disappoint is when you initially run out just before the game and then also obviously when you're singing the anthem at home everyone sings with you um and it, I kind of almost didn't want to sing because obviously I could still hear my terrible voice I kind of just wanted to almost just sit back and actually just listen to it but obviously you obviously want to sing the anthem as well but um yeah it was amazing I couldn't help but have a few little smiles every now and again. And just before the kickoff, as everyone's getting a bit ramped up, just kind of take a little look around and, and take it all in. And yeah, it was it was mega. And the reports potentially suggest another one at Leicester, maybe even bigger. Obviously, Leicester's a bit a bit bigger than King's Home. So um, yeah, it would be amazing if you could break that record twice in three weeks. And if, lo- if this week was um, the opportunity for the entire Hunt family um, and all of their extended relatives to roll out in support of Mo, then the Leicester game is going to be a Scarrett family reunion? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know, to be fair. I haven't checked in with with too many people to see what their plans are. I leave that up to them. Um, but yeah, it would. I think there are definitely a few people are planning to get there. Obviously, it's a lot easier to leave the farm when you've only got to travel half an hour to, to the game rather than hours down the motorway or, or on a flight. So, um, yeah, it would be awesome to have a lot of people there. I know there's, you know, lots of local clubs, old clubs, people from school and all that sort of stuff that are hopefully heading towards that game. So, yeah, it will be, uh, if I'm obviously playing or if, even if I'm not playing, it will be awesome to see an England women's game in my hometown. Definitely. Um, let's go back. Were they, how was the shed? I just need to go back and check how the shed in there. Were there any good perlers of one-liners that came out there? Um, they've, always, they've normally got at least a couple a game. <laughs> I think it was pretty tame, to be fair. I personally didn't hear any. I think, I, I'm, and I'm just guessing, but I imagine it probably wasn't the, the genuine shed that were in there. It was probably, you know, the, the England... Red Roses substitute so it was all support and all happiness I think coming from the shed but yeah I would have liked to have heard a few to be fair I wonder if the Welsh got any maybe the Welsh got a few yeah. um, that means they're on your side if you haven't heard them. yeah yeah exactly and I do feel like it was the junior shed yeah. because the crowd looked so young yeah it's so good I think it's just like, obviously when we go around after the game and the girls are so good at spending loads of time making sure that, you know, we get around and say thank you and have photos and sign things and whatnot. It is, it's, you know, lots of young boys and girls um, that are, are out there. They're telling you stories of the rugby club that they're from or the school that they're from or this, that and the other. Um, yeah, it's awesome to see. Um, what else do they yeah. say? And, and mums and dads as well and older people. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me this Shari, I told Shari this when I saw her at the weekend um, yeah so loads of people and I, I've, I've thought about it since and I wonder whether it was just their way of trying to coax me over to get me to sign something but we, I, nonetheless I heard a lot of we listen to your podcast we love your podcast yeah your podcast. yeah they so do I'll, I'll take that <laughs> <laughs> can we just on the topic of that have a moment for Laura Evans on Instagram who commented and said I can't believe I'm asking this but at Hunty at Elma Capelma what is the name of the dry shampoo please <laughs> <laughs> so good love that Laura Evans so uh, listening from it seems like she lives in Illinois um, <laughs> nice. I, I shared my dry shampoo recommendation with her directly there on the ground <laughs> nice. um, that was a nice bit of feedback um, but l- let's get just for a moment back to a massive performance and a solid 80 minutes from uh, Scazzy Legs 
How does that feel now? <laughs> lovely left-handed <laughs> yeah. passes also. Yeah, Ooh. good. It was thanks, Tins. Appreciate that. Yeah, it was good. It was good to get through eighty. Obviously, you're never quite sure um, whether you'll be one of the substitutions or not. But obviously, having not had much rugby in my legs, it was quite nice to to get that in. Cramp started to flicker in again, and I was trying really hard not to look at the time left on the clock because I thought it's not. I don't need to know if it's <laughs> if it's five minutes, it'll be over before I know it, and if it's twenty five minutes, then I, <laughs> I don't need to know that. Um, but yeah, luckily we we were able to to hang on. But yeah, awesome surface. Um, weather was fantastic, so we were able to just play some rugby, which is you know what I love to do. So you refused to take the lovely uh, the, the lovely anti-cramp drink again, did you? You didn't want that in your mouth again. Yeah, pretty much. I started stretching early doors so that hopefully I didn't have to. We didn't need to get to that that end point of having that horrible vinegar in the uh, in through the sachet. Um, but yeah, my physio was giving me stick all week about that because she was like, uh, when we'd driven from um, Bisham to Gloucester when we were moving, she uh, we all kind of arrived at a similar time. She was like, I've just listened to your podcast. And I was like, Oh, have you? Blah, blah, blah. She was like. I heard the bit you said about the cramp juice. <laughs> <laughs> so she got a little shout out. <laughs> now, um, on on the topic of things that you've experienced, when Abby Dow went down with what sounded like an absolutely horrific injury to anyone watching at home, I was I was still getting goosebumps thinking about it this morning. Um, I was wondering where that takes you to, because you had a pretty horrific break not too long ago that you've just recovered from. Um, does that um, unnerve someone like you who's got very recent trauma? Um, I, no, I don't think so, to be fair. If I'm honest, all I was thinking about was just her and hoping that, that obviously she was all right. Um, it's never nice to see. Um, obviously, I think the the sounds and the pain she was in was quite audible from from watching the game. Um, and yeah, you just, you just want her to be all right and you just want everything to to be as simple as it now possibly can for her in terms of her return and obviously looking ahead to a World Cup. We, we obviously don't know any of, the, any of those details, but um, yeah, it didn't take me back to, to mine. I think I've, I'm quite kind of literal and in the moment, so I've parked that one a, a while ago. But yeah, it was thinking of her, hoping she was all right. And then also obviously trying to manage that period of time best for the team and yourself to stay on it and stay present, but also then be ready to go again because it, it was quite a long stoppage. Yeah, you guys were running up and down, passing balls literally within the minute. Who Whose responsibility is that to say, okay, focus guys, we've still got a match ahead here? Yeah, so obviously Sarah Hunter does a lot of that. Um, our SNC, um, Alex Martin, came on the field and obviously getting water on. And because of the nature of it, you don't know if it's going to be, you know, a minute or... 15 minutes you just don't know so naturally everyone could, so often you'll see it people go off and start passing balls in lines of three or four when things like that happen it's like the classic keep warm drill isn't it but I think we we probably went a bit early with it um, so we'd done quite a few laps and then I was just like right guys we'll probably take a break here and then maybe do do some with a bit more purpose because you end up just jogging around and it's it's not particularly purposeful but as I say you, you just don't know how long you're, long you're going to be doing it for um yeah it's not not the ideal situation, but we we send all our best wishes to Abby. Yeah, for definite. And but you know, you also at the same time celebrated Jess Breach coming back. Uh, how did she find it? Obviously, back from a quite a long layoff, uh, managed to get a pork pie on her on her return. Was she was she happy? Was she? I, I imagine if she hadn't scored on the way back, she'd have been a grumpy grumpy little lady, having knowing what we know about her. But um, <laughs> uh, how was she, how was she after that? Yeah, obviously we sit next to each other in the change room because of our shirt numbers. So I was looking forward to catching up with her afterwards. And as I went back into the ch uh, change rooms after the game, she was getting drugs tested. So I didn't actually get a chance to catch up with her. So she was probably a bit grumpy about that. But <laughs> nonetheless, obviously, yeah, great to have her back. She's not had the easiest of seasons. Um, you know, a few injuries within that season that she's just come back from and then picked up another one and so on and so forth. So, yeah, to have her back was awesome. I think that that first try she scored down the right-hand side, she just got the ball stood up, uh, stood up the Welsh defender and went in untouched. When you see things like that, you're just like, oh yeah, she's she's quality. Yeah, and it means she's also back for she's back fully fit and confident as well, which is always a help, isn't it? Big time. Yeah. She yeah, she's such a good player, just a natural gas. Like we do these things called runways, which is just basically just sprinting um before one of our sessions. And she just 
she wins the race by a mile. Well, depending on who she's against, if she's against me, she wins the race by a mile, but she just looks so unbelievably natural. And if she's, she'd look like me jogging, but she's going full tilt. So <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I have a lot of admiration for that. I'm trying to find where we are with the fantasy league. Are you still killing you are, all of us? You. you. I'm so yeah, far you down. Are so far down. I think there's 48 in the group <laughs> and you're 44. I, am, I should just stop now. I should just give <laughs> it up. Yeah, no. But the problem is, like, I never properly concentrate when I'm busy doing this. It's like, oh, I'm just going to pick three players here and then I'm on the bus and do some more there. And then, oh, it's Saturday morning. Um, And then just... Like some more names. Um, so I've I was, obviously. I was saying I got done a little bit, uh, bit by players who suddenly dropped out. Uh, quite oh. a couple of the French players who ended up not playing. And then one of the Scottish players, uh, Vassal, oh. in play. But Joe Saracens is at the top. Oh, brilliant. Um, Go, Joe Saracens. Um, and yeah, I am in, uh, I am in 17th. Oh. And then we have to go. Out. And I think Guys. Uh, Shira's in 34th. And then <laughs> all the way down in 44th is oh. Elma Capella. Oh, my gosh. Elma. Okay. Um, <laughs> basically, we will never mention the Fantasy yeah. League again. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure what the Flintshire Ferrets are doing at the bottom of the league with <laughs> only... 567 points I think maybe they only play, they've only played one game I think totally yeah sure. I think there was an, a one round where I also didn't enter my team in time so there we go um, uh, speaking of uh, things that didn't go so well um, Ireland Italy um, I really I was very excited for that game and it's um, it's been sad seeing Italy uh, kind of perform the way they have so far in this competition but at the same time Ireland seemed to really pull um, a number of people out to Cork um, and they've got a few solid performers in their ranks a first win for their head coach Greg McWilliams um, they move into fourth unfortunately Italy uh, right at the foot of the table with me <laughs> yeah, they've been going well, Ireland. Um, they've got a load of their sevens girls kind of making up a lot of their back line, which will be really interesting to see. I'm not sure if, because there's a sevens tournament coming up soon, whether they'll lose them or whether they'll keep them. But um, yeah, it's good to see them going well. Obviously, they've they've certainly had their difficulties in this past year or so. Um, and in, in terms of inexperience, I think their team is, is full of that, but nonetheless going really well. And it's, it's really good to see. And I guess... <sighs> when you look at it and you think they're the one side that aren't going to the World Cup yet, you know, beating sides that are going, it's, I guess you, I don't know what the right word is, but you, I guess you kind of feel for them a little bit. But um, yeah, tough one for Italy as well. I'm not actually caught up on the game yet. Obviously, we'll, we'll do a lot of analysis on Ireland in the coming weeks. But um, yeah, tough one for Italy. I think they've got a big game coming up against Scotland at home, which I'm sure both mm. sides will be be really wanting to to, to get a hold of. And Scotland didn't do badly against France. Um, 8-28 the scoreline. But I mean, France were unbeaten <clears throat> and um, and Scotland actually really performed pretty well considering um, the form that France has been in. Did they keep them scoreless in the second half? Right, yes. So um, yeah, that Scot was impressive. Scot Scotland won the second half. Hmm. Yeah, Scotland won the second half, I think, 5-0. Um, so really good from them. But I think also it's probably testament to where Scotland are at at the moment in terms of they were still really disappointed after that game, playing, even though they were playing a side like France ranked third in the world, I think they are, whatever it is. Um, they were still really disappointed with that result. So um, I think the, the Scots are on the charge at the moment, perhaps not getting some of the results they want, but certainly from a, a mindset point of view and things that they're capable of, they're, they're definitely going to be ones that are going to be building. Um, there was that great Instagram post with Dupont and uh, Sansu in their French kits, the golden era for French number nines. Well, <clears throat> we'd say Dupont is the best in the men's in the world, but there's, um, I think there's quite a bit of competition for the best women's scrum half at the moment, particularly out of the England bunch, because that's a hotly contested one. Yeah, get my little blonde mate back on, and I'm sure she'll be ha should have something to say about <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, like you say, obviously we've we've got a fair few within our ranks, um, and there's yeah there's some brilliant nines across the rest of the world. But yeah, Sansusi's going really really well. She's 
kind of a catalyst for for that French team. And it's how they play as well, isn't it, in France? Their nine is so integral to to what they do and how they play the game and everything that they're they're about. So yeah, she's certainly be be one to watch in a few weeks. Um, so the one thing that um, has unfortunately also surfaced over the last week, um, which literally made me feel so uncomfortable reading it, but maybe it's because I've also worked in environments where things were, let's say, a little toxic, <clears throat> was the Black Ferns cultural review that came out. Now, the, the broader context of this is that um, this a version of this has now taken place in the Ireland rugby structures where a systemic problem, particularly around the women's game, was highlighted by players and and, and finally addressed. Um, Canada have had their own experiences with this. And we saw the way the Black Ferns played in the autumn and everyone went, mm, something here isn't right. And there we have it. Um, comments um, that are culturally insensitive, alleged favoritism, ghosting, body shaming from coaches, a lack of clarity on how the leadership group is selected. I mean, the um, the list of things that you can pull out of here, I saw so many people basically doing threads on Twitter talking about it. Um, but as someone who's never played in a high performance environment, what I can relate to is a toxic work environment where you are put... Um, on a very public facing platform and you're having to deliver and people will hold you accountable because they don't understand what's happening behind the scenes and have no appreciation for it. Um, it must be very hard um, as a player, particularly when you are playing for your country. It's not just um, a very public platform. It is a national platform where you're representing. Um how does it make you feel when you when you see stuff like this come out? Um, as a competitor, I guess, you want to be sure that everyone is competing at their very best and has the best shot at kind of running out there and giving you a good run for it. Yeah, it's it's obviously really disappointing. Um, I think, as you say, you you want to play against um, you, or you want to play against everybody and feel like they're on a level playing field in terms of the the environment that they have and you know, the opportunities that they have and all that sort of stuff. So I guess this is one occasion where it, it is not like that. Um, I think it's, obviously, I don't I don't know the details. Um, it's not something that obviously I would ask the players about, the, the ones that I know from those countries. It's not, it's probably not appropriate, but from obviously things that have come out, it's just, it's really disappointing. I think, you, you know, you don't necessarily hear of this much in a in a man's environment, whether that's just the difference between men and women. There's, I know there was some stuff that came out in that report as to, or people questioning whether more women should be in that environment in terms of the the roles that are had, um, in terms of coaching roles and stuff, just because th- there definitely is a difference working with females to working with males and perhaps the environment that you create around them, how you're able to talk to them, things that are and aren't kind of... Um, accepted as as well as other things um and again from from not having been in that environment I, I don't know but um it it's really disappointing I think you know you've just listed three countries there that, are, that have all gone through you know definitely different but from the outset similar things um and I guess if it promotes change and it promotes better things then great but you don't want to be in that situation in the first place you've played in many different environments when the culture is at a systemic level bad. How long does it take to turn it around? Look, I, I think it gets turned around. It can get turned around pretty quickly. I, I think, you know, unfortunately, they, they, Black Ferns would have come over in the autumn and had what they would have classed a terrible tour. It makes no difference whether you're a man or a woman. It's understanding how you can speak to people. You know, we, we talked about this on the on the good, the bad, the rugby. And, uh, you know, Eddie Jones was obviously part of that conversation again. Not the players to love him because he talks to them in the right way, but then all the media and fans really struggle. They either love him or hate him because of the way he speaks to them. So, you know, it's... it. But what makes a great environment to play in is where you understand your players. Um, you know, Ellis talked about um, Steve Borthwick and his ability to learn from the likes of Ellis about certain players and how to speak to them, how to get the best of them. Ellis needs a challenge every now and again. He needs a, a sharpener, half time. Uh, it was your mistake in that line that caused that try. We need to sharpen that up. And that gets him done in the right way. But some people don't need that. Hask needs a 
these two arms wrapped around him and a big hug and say, you're the greatest player in the world. Some people, you know, there are different motive, And when it goes wrong, it normally goes catastrophically wrong because mm. you only need to get it wrong with two or three players and, and morale drops and, you know, it shifts to them backroom talking or mm. Mm. whatever. And then it's hard, it's hard to mm. pull it back uh, without, a, like, fr- you know, everything off your chest you know, sort of talk in front, uh, open and honest conversation in front. So, look, I think Emily will say they still have fantastic players throughout that team. So I, I wouldn't say that this is a hard thing to fix. Now, if this is a sharpener the other way to the coaches that are involved that need to actually understand more about their players and maybe uh, understand about what makes them tick, then it's only a positive thing. It says that he's committed to learning and getting better. Now, proof will be in the pudding of that, and and but unfortunately, is that going to be the World Cup where the proof is in the pudding? Now, that that's that that's get an intense an intense place to put that <laughs> that pudding. But you know, as as Emily always says, is they they always get it together uh, when it comes around to World Cup time. So uh, we'll we'll have to wait and see. But hopefully, didn't you feel when you read that, like that interview we had when we had Ruby Tui on the pod? literally echoed in the back of your mind yeah a little bit um ruby's class isn't she and she she speaks so well about those sorts of environments and she spoke really fondly didn't she of alan bunting who that was the sevens coach for a long time and part of the sevens environment for a long time and that was essentially the reason she gave for going to to play for I think it was the chiefs wasn't it that was that was pretty much her reason as to go in there because she believed in him she trusted him and that then she wanted to go and follow him wherever he went um and i think that that speaks mountains of of coaches and um and the respect that she obviously has for him but unfortunately that's obviously not matched um everywhere and and through all parts of of rugby in in New Zealand and yeah look i think the one thing that they have shown in the recent weeks with the with the um announcements of of new coaching staff or however they've deemed them support staff additions to the environment whatever they are is that they're you know they they know they've got to change certain things and they're going to take the next six seven months however long it is incredibly seriously to make sure that they are absolutely flying for their home world cup and i think what you need to remember from um a six nations perspective is that there's also the pack four coming up that the Pacific um, nations will play against one another in what is our summer in the North, but what will be a Southern Hemisphere winter tour. So there will be an opportunity still here for quite a lot of work um, and road testing of all of the kind of changes that they've instituted now to go into it. But I did wonder because um, since you often talk about the women's game kind of being where the men's game was in the 90s when it professionalized, is this a symptom of women's rugby and a gender thing? Or is this a symptom of a structure that is professionalizing? And some of some parts of it is still very amateur and some parts of it are very professional. And there's this kind of disconnect. Yeah, you've actually put that in a pretty uh, a very a very clever way if I, if I took myself back there the amount of times you got absolute bollockings whilst in 97 the way the way you were coached you know sessions were flog sessions they weren't they weren't actually have any structure any base to what you're doing what you're trying to get out of it it was more about just flogging you for the sake of flogging you and then shouting at you for the sake of shouting at you um now i would hope that it wouldn't it shouldn't be all the way back there in, mm. so, in some respects. I don't think it, because there's too much knowledge around yeah. for, f- from professional sport over every sport about how you manage people, how you everything else. But still, if if the, co- if the coaches that are coaching haven't quite coached at that fully professional level or they haven't quite, you know, they haven't, they haven't tasted too much of it, then maybe that can still fall in. It's not, it doesn't make it right. And and as long as they accept that and they move on, but you know, yes, there what that was, but I, I wouldn't expect it to be valid in this situation because there's, you know, this is New Zealand. This is, they've got a professional, they've been at the top end of the game for forever. Mm. They're, they're, they're working within that same unit. It would be remiss if that they've let that slip that they haven't, they haven't teed up. You know, the whole thing about the All Blacks has been built on finding, you know, the recreation of what the hacker means to everyone, what it means playing for your country, what it means 
to put on that jersey. And I don't think, uh, you know, I, I'd find it hard to believe that they, that they would they would miss it by that much for for the for the Black Ferns. I just I just I wouldn't expect it. But that's not to say it can't happen. Mm. You know, our people. You know, when when you're not professional, you're not used to having. You don't normally have, or you you're not in a professional area. You don't. You're not used to taking criticism, where some sometimes now you have to because you, that's the environment you're now in. I don't know. It's are people. I think there's a lot of figuring out to go on. Mm. You now, is everyone going to get it right? Well, obviously not because we're we're reading this now. But everyone's learning, and I think we've got to try and focus on the positives of trying to get better. And the only the people who can do that are the players in the group can give feedback to the coaches. Mm. I would prefer it not to come out. Yeah. in a review like this. Yeah. I would prefer it to uh, be in a room where the players sit down with the coach and go, look, that doesn't work for us, that doesn't work for us. And then if the coach stands up and throws a wobbly, then probably he's not the right man for the job. Whereas if he goes, okay, I'm really sorry, let's let's get this better. Always bring this to the attention. It should come down to a review. It should this when you're in an environment that's that's really healthy and succeeds, these things come up day to day. Naturally. Say, you yeah. say day to well, you don't say that. I don't like that. Yeah. That's where you're in a comfortable situation and a comfortable environment where you go. Look, I, I don't respond well to that, but then that's the characters of the, and that's that's how you manage characters. Is you got to know some people might not say want to have a confrontation. Mm. And go, look, I don't like that, mm. but then mm. some might go. I actually, yeah, I like it when you sort of get into me a bit. If I do something wrong, keep me sharp, keep me. But then you know, you always have people who are sensitive. And and rightly so, yeah. it's probably one of their strengths. So you then need to understand that as a coach, and you need to go and when you do how you deliver criticism, it has to be delivered in the right way that that they actually understand what you're saying, explain it to them, and then they'll go away and they'll work on it. And I think the point is that um, in order to really perform a, a peak performance, it's not about it's not only about how physically fit you are. It's not only about what the shape that you're in. It's also about how psychologically safe you feel in that space and how free you are to express, you know, whatever it is that you feel. But I mean, they've got 50% of the side are Maori, 25% are Pacifica. Um, and, and one of the things that did come out is that they want a greater understanding from management on how to communicate specifically in a culturally sensitive and safe um, manner, which I mean, as a as a South African, I come from a place where we have these very uncomfortable conversations around what might be completely acceptable and normal and actually required. And some cultural environments are entirely offsides yeah. in others, um, and it does does require a lot of um, very direct and very uncomfortable kind of chats to be had. But if you don't go through them, you'll yeah, never you're never, you you're never going to get to where you want to go. So you have to look at this as a process in the fact that it's in some way I don't I don't like it coming out like this to no. be honest but it has to come out it yeah. has to come through the wash because no, no otherwise nothing will change. Mm. That is a learning process that the people you know the coaches that are going to coach those black ferns have to take on board have to learn have to adapt have to because they might you know if they haven't coached you know that before they yeah. have to learn that it's a skill set that a coach has to have. Mm. Now you would hope that you know, I don't know what the the mix is in in the in the men's side, but there should be someone in the in the all black setup that can come and help with that, even if it's one of the players. Yeah. Even if it's a a, a Maori player and a and a Pacific player that play for the all black, they can come and they can put time in with the coaches and and explain how they deal with it. Mm. I mean, there's got to be the support groups to make this a pretty easy transaction. Uh, transaction, pretty easy transformation. Yeah. But. Uh, we, we don't know whether that's happening. It might be happening, I don't know. The upside is, when you're coaching women, they're going to be open to talking about their feelings. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Okay. So uh, we're really looking forward we're really, really looking forward to seeing what the Black Ferns do next and how they rise from this phase, uh, which undoubtedly seems to be a painful one. Um Ruby Tui, however, if anything, if uh, the, the conversation we had with her is anything to go by, there are some phenomenal characters there um, and some women who are have insane self-awareness and just like so much capacity um, for empathy and, and growth. And speaking of phenomenal people who seems to just have an endless capacity for growth, um, it's our own Emily Scarrett who played her 99th test against Wales and she's 
literally leaning back in her seat, making the vomit face. <laughs> because she doesn't want to talk about this. But we're going to talk about the fact that she played in her 99th test. And the next one that she played, whether this is against Ireland at Welford Road or whether it is against France in Bayonne or whether it's at the World Cup or where. Ooh, there's a, there's a question. Which would you want it to be? A Grand Slam game in <laughs> France? At home. Or at home in front of your family and your friends in your own backyard with a patch possibly packed I would take whatever I can get I don't think you get to this point in your career and start being picky about things um yeah I mean look it, it's um it's wild to think that the next time I put on the shirt will be for my hundredth if and when obviously you hope that you get that opportunity um but yeah otherwise I'm, I don't want to I'm not thinking too much about it still two weeks to be had there's still two weeks of training that, that I've got to get through and survive um We'll see. We'll see. Do you look you at nine, talk about it. Do you look at ninety nine and go, <laughs> How did this happen? Like who let me do this ninety nine times over? Yeah. yeah, it's madness. Cause I think as well, like obviously I spent a, quite a long time, I think it was maybe like four or five years of my career playing sevens. So I never really like you set certain goals obviously through your career. I never really had this as one because I didn't think I pl- because I played both codes and missed a lot. I never thought I'd get anywhere near it, to be honest with you. Um, and obviously now I am quite near it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have no idea where it where it's gone. A couple of the girls asked me the day, I was like, when did you get caps? And I was like, 2008. And it's not until you say 2008, realise what the year is right now, that actually that <laughs> you realise that that's a hell of a long time ago because it just doesn't feel like that. It feels like, you know, that whole thing has happened in like five years or something daft. Um, but yeah, it's been... It's been a wild ride. Look, ne- never let anyone tell you that you're too old. That's that's the thing. If you play and you enjoy, <laughs> I mean, I think I I, I actually uh, when I played the other day, I, I, I I'm starting to think that I am too old. But uh, you know, you, you just enjoy it as long as you're still getting it done. Uh, I would, I would, you never give it up. Never give it up until it's just not because you, yeah. you, you you can never go back really. This so stay on it. Yeah, there's quite a few of us, obviously, in the squad that are of a similar age. Obviously, Sarah Hunter's a little bit older. There's quite a few of us around that thir- like early 30s bracket. And all the girls, like, call us old and stuff. And we're all, like, look at each other and we're like, we're not even that old. Like, in the grand scheme of things, we're not even that old. But I think it's a bit of an ongoing joke. And we just need to be a bit careful that we rein that back in and stop, <laughs> actually stop believing so what, what everyone takes the mick out of us t- for and what we start saying. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what was big in yeah. 2008? Was, what are you going to pull out now? What? Apple bottom jeans, <laughs> boots with the, <laughs> boots with <laughs> the, the fur. fur, boots with the oh, I'm looking at her. Do you know what also You're what was big club. in 2008? Blackberries. <laughs> oh wow! If you are listening to this and you do not know what, what a blackberry it? is, <laughs> blackberry. Blackberry was big so in good. 2008. Do you know what was also really big in 2008? Buying. Ringtones. Mm. When you used to pay money, oh, yeah, the crazy, crazy that. frog, and <laughs> to have a ringtone like that, that sounded like um, "Bleeding Love" by yeah. Le- Leona. Was it Leona Lewis? Lewis? Yeah, Leona yeah? Lewis. keep bleeding. Leona Lewis. There we yeah. go. Things that were big in two thousand and eight. Ring, 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 ring. Flip video <laughs> HD cameras were big in two thousand and eight, and MacBooks were white. Ah, oh, the old plasticky white Remember ones. Remember the white ones. Yeah. Oh, Lost. We all were watching Lost. There you go. Just a little rewind. The other thing that was really big in 2008 was the jersey that Emily Scarrett made her debut in. You know how I said that it doesn't seem that long ago? You've just made it seem an yeah. entire sure decade. It was 2008. Oh, no, longer than a decade ago. <laughs> ages ago. We still poked people <laughs> yeah. on Facebook back then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I never did that. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you with that, Emily. I've, I've, um, I've never poked a single soul on, uh, <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> on Facebook. Um, my first shirt was um, enormous. It was uh, Gilbert back in the day. It was terribly fitted. It was one that if you just had hung on the hanger, you'd think like it was for my dad. Um so I'm grateful things like that have come a long way. It was like the wide leg jogging bottoms, whereas everything now is like tapered and slim. 
yeah, so the, the kit has definitely come a long way. But yeah, first cap was Isha Rugby Club 2008 against America, which was just, yeah, wild. Where were you when you got the first call? Like that you, well, the, 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 when you were told you're going to make your debut, it's happening. It's real. I've, I've told this story a few times, actually. I, I first, Streety, uh, Gary Street, who was head coach at the time, he had hinted or he'd spoken to me earlier in the year about maybe being a part of um, a Euros competition. But that was when I was doing my A-levels because I was only 18 at the time. And we decided kind of together that probably wouldn't be the best time. Anyway, so then A-levels had come and gone. And then in the summer, he called me and I was on my post-A-level first holiday with away with friends um, holiday. So he called me during that holiday. Obviously, I was probably dreadfully hungover. Um, I'm surprised I even answered the phone in the first place. But <laughs> basically, he called me and was like, hey, Skaz, like, we want to get you a part of what was called the Nations Cup then, which was basically only a couple of weeks after or I think it might have been the week after I was going to land back from this holiday. Um, so I was like, obviously buzzing, like, yeah, great, brilliant. But now I had to try and figure out where the gym was in this hotel that obviously I only knew where the bar was and um, figure out all these other things that I got to get this like training regime back on track because I was living my best life as an 18 year old on my first kind of non-parent holiday. Um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. What's quite annoying is I can't, find a picture of you from your first cat with your jersey on. I'm really kind of trying hard to look. Brit Abroad went full pro in the hotel gym. <laughs> can you remember your first one? <laughs> how much can you remember of your first cat? Like, uh, I would say my experience? jersey was probably very similar. <laughs> they were ginormous back there, back <laughs> in those days. Um, uh, mine was 2000. Wow. Um, Y2K. Yeah. Yeah. Mar March the... 13th or something against Ireland um, yeah uh, uh, what can I remember I remember the anthem uh, I remember bits of it uh, I've, I've seen it a couple of times so uh, I remember uh, I scored in the corner which I always remember as Ben Cohen scored two because he was getting his debut at the same day um, so yeah it was uh, not. I don't remember the whole detail of it but um I remember mum and dad really struggling with it. They got really nervous, whereas I was all right. Aww. So they carried my nerves for me. So but it was all right. You weren't getting drunk on holiday when you got the first call? No. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, no, because I'd, uh, yeah, I, I joined up in 99 with the uh, with the World Cup squad when Yanni De Beer decided to meanly <laughs> drop kickers out of the World Cup. Um so I joined up with there and I'd, be, I'd been on all that sort of training camp and stuff. So I'd had a bit of time around the squad. So that was quite nice. And uh, to have that, you'd, you'd, you'd form some bonds there. You weren't going into the unknown of just walking straight into Martin Johnson and all those boys. So you'd had the introductory sort of phase with it. So it was quite nice. Who were the players that you were scared of or intimidated by when, as an 18-year-old, you strutted into that camp and you went, I'm not speaking to that person until they speak to me? I'll tell you one thing. I didn't strut. I walked in, my legs shaking, I think. Um, I, yeah, I didn't have any introductory sessions, that's for sure. I was straight in. Um, I, so I knew Sarah Hunter um, and a couple of the other girls that played at Litchfield because that's where I'd just moved to. Um, but other than that, I didn't know anybody. So people like Amy Garnett, um, Jane Leonard, some like, who are lovely when you get to know them, but on a first impression and on a how they play rugby basis, they are scary as hell. Um, and I remember a few of them give, making sure that I knew where I was and what environment I was coming into, kind of giving me, you know, a bit of a nudge and a hard shoulder in the first contact that they were able to, to get in, involved with. Um, so, yeah, that was... It was quite a daunting environment for sure, but um, yeah, I definitely, I don't think I said a word for about the first six months that I was in a part of that squad. <laughs> I mean, how was that at the start, actually? Because you look at where the women's game is now and, you know, you're only really just really dabbling with the full-time professional. So what was, like, what was it like back then walking in? What was the, the training like? What was... How organised was it? You know, you're playing for your country and I, I'm, I'm going to imagine it's, it was pretty disorganised in terms of how you got around. Um, obviously, it had gone back to the old uh, expenses thing. You'd be putting in your expenses. You'd travel to 
London via LA <laughs> just to get, get some money back. Um, <laughs> how, how was that? How was that? Yeah, it was um, different, definitely. I think obviously I come out of an under-20s programme, so actually it was... It was a step up. Everything was a step up from the previous thing. But like we would stay in like army barracks, so we'd be in the um, the accommodation there. We also played and stayed at a place called Haythrop Park, which I think is where some of either Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter was filmed. So it's quite like these grand, well, grand looking at least, massive old school buildings. Um, yeah, it was just it was just a different time. Like it was sketchy going in as a youngster because I went in by myself that I didn't go in with anybody else didn't get a cap with anybody else um and yeah it was it was daunting like I, it, I'm not gonna pretend that I had the best time to start with because I was just a youngster trying to survive I think and um trying to get by but um yeah it was scary because I was I was then at uni so then I was driving back to Leeds so the expenses did do well for me because I was driving back from <laughs> London to Leeds um all through the the, all the weeks and weekends and three six nations and stuff um but yeah it was yeah it was scary the scariest thing th- trying to think of a first song uh, first cap song to sing on the bus in front of a load of people that you know are going to boo you you don't really know any of them yet none of them like well not none of them like you but none of them know you well enough to like you none of them want you to sing well um that was that was not a pleasant experience and what was it, have we had what your song was originally? Have we had that yet? Uh, I don't know. I think basically I, because I was the only one getting capped and the journey from the game to back to the, wherever we were staying was quite long. I went through what felt like about eight different songs before they actually let me sing one because I don't know about how it works with you guys, but you're not allowed to repeat a song somebody else has sang. So you start singing one and then they just start screaming down the bus. We've had it. We've had it. Even if they have or they haven't. Um, so I ended up with, um, oh, who sings it? YMCA. Who sings YMCA? <laughs> the men at work um, or YMCA. Oh my gosh. The village people. Yes. I was going to say, I should quite know annoyed Village that I know people. That. That's <laughs> it, men at work. Men at work is, is far better. So it's just... Down Under. If you'd have done Down Under, that's better than village oh. people, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it was probably one of the ones I tried to get through. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot. What did you sing? I sang Leaving on a Jet Plane. Wow. Yeah. So, that is deep and romantic. And I happened, to, I reckon I spent more time worrying about that during the week than I did the game, for sure. Yeah, 100%. It's just, it's basically just a diversionary tactic to um, not have you obsess about uh, the first time you touch the ball. Yeah, maybe. Possibly. <laughs> I mean, I, the, 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 you've always got to get through the fact that that booing is coming and you've just got to dig in. I, we, I don't think there is a repeat. I don't think there is a repeat. Thing. Uh, I, I've never experienced it. You've just got to get through the absolute abuse that comes your way. And the thing is, you should, you've just got to never stop. Just keep going. Just Basically pick a song that people can join in with because then they'll start singing with you. Don't pick anything quirky. Don't, Josh Lucy, a B-side track from Oasis. Like, no one knows. Not no. the best choice. Um, Matt Stevens, who can obviously sing because he went on... Uh, he, oh, he's, yes, he, he was the on... Celebrity. Yes. Um, X Factor. What X was Factor, it? X Factor, yeah. Um, uh, and he'd just go, guys, guys, come on. Oh, I'm going to sing here. And then he'd start again. Like, Boo! Uh, and he'd stop again. Guys, I, I, you know, I want to do this. We don't care if you can sing. We don't care if it tastes good. If it's, it tastes good? If it, if it sounds good, just get singing. And he couldn't deal with it. And he'd just he was like, guys, guys, just get on with it. Take the booze and then just sing something that they can all join in once it gets to a chorus. That's... Uh, that's the only thing you need. Well, uh, Aoife Wafer from Ireland picked a great one and I saw she had to perform it and we could all watch the replay of it. It was Party in the USA, right? Miley Cyrus? That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. The girls got behind her with that one. Although I don't know if what's more, I think doing it on a pitch where there's a lot of social media, I definitely wouldn't have appreciated that I was probably quite grateful back in my day that there was only a couple of blackberries around that could potentially (laughs) film it (laughs) so you've you've done some cool stuff I mean you helped England to victory in the 2009 (laughs) Six Nations then 2010 
Oh, you would uh, join top try scorer in 2009 with Fiona Pocock. 2010, 2011, 2012, 2019, 2020, 2021, maybe 2022. Um, you became the highest ever England rugby point scorer two years ago. 2020 Women's Six Nations Player of the Championship. You won a World Cup. 2010 and 2017, you were a finalist at the World Cup. Commonwealth Bronze Medal, 2018. Olympian with the Sevens. World Player of the Year in 2019. Is there a favorite? Is it, is it like one thing? Is it actually like a completely silly other thing that none of us know about? Like we list, look at this insane list of accomplishments and go, whoa. I, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Obviously, like winning the World Cup was mega. Um, and obviously being able to be a proper part of that was crazy. But like, I genuinely sometimes just cherish like the little memories more so, like the, the little things that happen in training or the moments with your friends or the nights out afterwards, stuff like that. And that's not to kind of put aside any of your other achievements, but they're the bits that you'll probably remember and will mean more to you like as you continue on through your life post rugby, I think, and the friendships that you made and all that stuff. And it sounds really corny, doesn't it? But um, yeah, I think uh, like until you list things like that, I don't think there's no way I've taken all of that in yet, um, which is mad. Just keep living it. Keep living the dream. Jeez. I mean, she's not even done yet. That's the crazy thing here. She's got at least four more years. The way four she's playing, 80 minutes four in those scazzy years. legs. Yeah. Four more years. <laughs> I, think there's, I think they need to uh, actually check those knee guards. I think there's something illegal in there. Let's just keep it going. <laughs> here, <laughs> it here first. It's right. only three more years as well. Oh, oh of yes. Course it is. It's only three more years. Yeah. 2025, it's around the corner, yeah. guys. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Well. We are really excited, as you can tell. We're building up steam uh, for whenever the th this 100th test uh, cap might roll around. Um, you must have a, a good week uh, out in, well, camp, but not camp camp, because this is pretend camp <laughs> this week. And then Easter weekend. What is on, on the Easter weekend? Is there a menu, a custom uh, do you make something? Uh, is there a Skaz family farm tradition where there's an Easter egg hunt going down? What's the crack? There's always an Easter egg hunt that gets unbelievably competitive. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing one of those again. We've now got, we've got a, a new addition to the family in that we've, like my brother um, and my sister-in-law have had a little one in the last year. So I think the, the Easter egg hunt might have to become actually child friendly whereas before it was never child friendly so um yeah so that'll be fun um and then yeah got a few people's birthdays and bits and bobs and just hopefully just being a normal person in the midst of obviously what is a a mad tournament at the moment lovely well there you have it the easter mm. weekend <laughs> what are you up to are you, i think you're a baker no candlestick maker no 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 and i'm not she hiding is not a baker no no, and I'm not hiding Easter eggs from my cats. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably just um, going to spend some time with my husband, who's now in the same country as I am. Um, Sounds nice, isn't it? I have um, my cousins coming to visit me uh, who study in Portsmouth, and I haven't seen them for over a decade. Um, oh. They live in Greece, um, and uh, I haven't seen them for ages. So now that we're on the same island, we... You know, get to hang out over Easter, so long lost family reunion. And nice. Uh, well, my two have got chicken pox at the moment, so that's brilliant. Oh, um, oh gosh. There's no uh, Easter camps for them. So, um, so no, uh, I think, uh, I don't know. So Zara's, Zara's competing this week, so we're gonna, we were going to go follow hers, but we need, we need the chicken pox. We need the pox to clear up. Mm. So they're on the way out. So um, hopefully that'll be all right. What's, what's your Easter egg of choice? There you go. There's a question. Uh, definitely not white chocolate. That stuff must be stopped. Lena smashed a white chocolate one the other day. So I, I'm, I agree with you though. I'm not a white chocolate fan. How is it even called chocolate? There's no chocolate in there. The cocoa is missing. <laughs> There's just sugar though, which seems. I to asked make... you what your favourite was, Alma. Not to, not to shame all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> Anything um, relatively dark and relatively chocolatey, but I don't like those cream egg things. With the, uh, the goo you mustn't ones. put the goo on the inside. No. The, the, the sugary goo. No one needs that either. 
A mini egg one. If there's a mini egg one, no. I'll be all over a mini egg one. And you? Classic. A classic. How am I not surprised? Yeah, uh, I'm not a cream egg fan either. Um, if I'm not allowed to say white chocolate because we're shaming it, I'll maybe like a, like a Malteser bunny. They're good. Yeah. They're very good. I, I agree. Malt- Maltesers is is the way to go. A Maltese bunny. Richard always buys the lint one because it comes with a little bell and the cats literally destroy those bells. So then there's something for me and something for the cats to play with for the next week. He's a wise man. He knows how to keep, he knows he knows how to keep, how to keep, keep a happy house. Everyone is happy. As long as we have enough little bells around for the cats to chase, then everything's good. Okay, well, we'll be back with the more the good, the scars and the rugby next time. Uh, I hope that you have a safe and festive Easter weekend break wherever you might be and make sure that you tell your friends uh, give us a rating share the episode if you enjoyed it we've been the good the scars and the rugby see you next week the show is produced by Shara Kilgallen and researched by Jenna Claridge the good the scars and the rugby is a folding pocket production 